Why do I continue to enjoy plays that cause me pain? Hey, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about another Shakespeare tragedy, which is Coriolanus. Um, this play is not one of his most popular, but it's definitely gotten more popular thanks to the recent production done in London and Dotmore Warehouse. Um, I won't actually be talking about that production in this video, but if you are interested, I was lucky enough to see it um, while I was abroad in January. And I have a blog post about it on my blog called Martin Freeman is Not a Hedgehog, which you can read about there if you're interested. But otherwise, we're just going to focus on the text of the play here and talk a little bit about that and the character of Coriolanus himself. So Coriolanus is the story of a Roman warrior who is rewarded for beating an enemy known as the Volscians. And upon beating them, he is given the surname Coriolanus. His real name is Caius Meridus. And he is proclaim this war hero. And a little bit like maybe if you're familiar with the Hunger Games, familiar with Cato from that book series, you can kind of compare Coriolanus in that way as this warman, Roman warrior who is very much known for killing people. That's his job. That's what he does with his life. And he's never really been trained to do anything else. However, his mother persuades him to, be, to become counsel for the um, plebeians, despite his contempt for the plebeians. And he um, is persuaded to become this political leader, even though he doesn't really have the rhetoric skills for it, and he enjoys talking about how much he hates the plebeians quite frequently. And he, it, the play becomes very much this uh, focus on elections, which as an American in every four years we have very interesting election cycles. I really enjoyed this aspect of the play and focusing on this political situation, which is strangely current despite the fact that it was written a long time ago. What's really fascinating for me about the character of Coriolanus is the fact that he is so intensely dislikable for the way that he talks about plebeians, the way he treats people, the sort of violence he portrays, but at the same time you can't help but feel kind of sorry for him because he ends up in this political situation with none of the skills that he really should have in order to be a proper council leader. And so he is very much at out of his depth. And you kind of start feeling sorry for him. You admire his stubbornness in a way. There's a quote that he says in Act 3.2. Why did you wish me milder? Would you have me false to my nature? Rather I, rather I say I play the man I am. And this is one of the most famous quotes from that play. And he, there's something very admirable in the fact that he wants to stick by this person that he is, that he is this killer. He is a killing machine. That's what he's been raised to do. He is violent. He is prone to being argumentative and these series of rage that he portrays. But he doesn't want to change. He doesn't want to become someone else, someone he's not. And as in Shakespeare, he's always the playwright's always very self-reflective upon theater. And so it's really interesting to see him use this character as a sort of means to consider what theater does, whether what you see on stage is false. And these strange sort of undercurrents of being unsettled with acting itself. Now I admit to having a nice strong stubborn streak in me, so Coriolanus's resistance to change kind of echoes with me, and the fact that he finds himself this person who is rewarded for being the man he is, but then is suddenly asked to become someone else, and is resistant to that, is, is really powerful um, in a culture that is constantly asking people to change to certain whims or society's expectations, that has a certain echo that I'm not really sure that Shakespeare would have ever planned on when he wrote it, but maybe he did. He likely did. There were a lot of interesting uh, cultural situations at his time. But it, it definitely is a very interesting notion now with things like mass media and pop culture and celebrity culture that this is very, very powerful message that I really appreciate. Something else that's really interesting about Coriolanus as a character is that he's hardly ever on stage by himself. He's this very solitary figure. At one point, they kind of describe him as a lonely dragon. But he's very, very infrequently on stage alone. In fact, only in Act 2.3, Act 3, Act 2, Scene 3, and then in Act 4, Scene 4, is he actually on stage solitary, completely on his own. And this doesn't last for a very long time. He constantly feels isolated, he appears isolated, but he's often surrounded by other people. Also interesting, facts that I kind of pondered while re-reading the play, is that he is an only child. He's raised by his mother, he does not have a father figure. And the, the interesting relationship he has with his mother is very fascinating as she puts a lot of pressure on him, has a lot of expectations, and as an only child myself, I find that kind of interesting. I don't have a relationship like he does, but it's just interesting to see sort of how maybe Shakespeare ties that into his own character and it's sort of an undercurrent of having these certain 
plans that his mother has for him that maybe he himself never really harbored, but as her means of gaining positions in society, it's a really fascinating aspect. And because this is a Shakespeare tragedy, this play ends horrendously, it's a very tragic ending. Um, Coriolanus is ultimately banished for his words against the plebeians, he is seen as a traitor, and for reasons I don't quite understand about him, he decides that instead of just running off and starting a new life like maybe other people would in Shakespeare plays, he decides to go meet up with his friend Ophidius, who's not his friend, it is his worst enemy, and they decide to try and sack Rome together, which ultimately ends in Coriolanus being persuaded by his mother not to do so, but then the Volscians and Ophidius are not very happy about Coriolanus wanting to backtrack on his plans of sacking Rome, and so they conspire to kill him instead. And it's a very unusual sort of ending, I feel like, because often Shakespeare leaves loose ends, but you know nothing about the state of Rome at the end of this play. You have no idea what happens to Coriolanus' family. You don't know what becomes of the Volscians. There's just so much left to interpretation and left to wandering. And as I don't have a very strong basis in Roman history, and even if I did, I don't think Coriolanus is one of the most well-known figures of Roman history, that there would be really a lot to gather about what did happen to anyone he and his family. I believe that this play is adapted from a Roman um, account by Plutarch, I think. Um, but even then, I don't think that there would be a lot of what we, a lot of information we could gather about what would happen to his family. Um, also, around the same time as rereading the play, I recently saw Schiller's Mary Stuart, which a production which was the translation was also recently done in 2005 at Donmar, and I saw that same production here in Minneapolis. And it's really interesting to see those two plays close together. Um, there's a lot of politics going on there, and after seeing Mary Stewart, you can kind of understand why Coriolanus is so reluctant to get into politics when you see what, in Shakespeare's contemporary time, what Elizabethan politics were like, and how much you have to do to, you know, appease your monarch. It's kind of exhausting, and I can understand why anyone would be reluctant to jump into that. I think what about this play hurts most of all is the fact that so much of it is based upon Coriolanus's rash decisions, his sudden lack of judgment, and the fact that he doesn't. there is not a lot of self-reflecting on his part in this play. It isn't like Hamlet where it's to be or not to be. He's considering who is he, what is his purpose. He knows what his purpose is. His purpose is to fight. That's what he does. And so there isn't a lot of like self-personal reflection as there are in other Shakespeare plays, the soliloquies are very different, and there are far, far fewer of them. Um, but, but what makes this so tragic is that he goes headlong into this, into this revenge plan against Rome, essentially, but it all falls apart, and he, who could have been this great war hero, becomes a traitor in his people's eyes. And he's, he ends, instead of a war hero, he ends as a traitor, banished from his homeland, and terribly murdered. And it's just, it's very sad in a way that is a little bit different than other Shakespeare plays, in that you feel terrible for this person who really has his, has made bad decisions, but at the same time it's you kind of get the sense of what sort of decisions would I make in that situation, what would I do. I also think there's a lot going on with history in this play and how we tell history and how we remember people, how we think of someone as a hero versus a traitor, and how we tell their stories. Um, there's a quote in this edition of Coriolanus which has some really, really great Oh, here we go. The Cambridge edition of Coriolanus has some really great um, information about it before the play. And it comes from Charles Spencer. And what Charles Spencer says, how he describes Coriolanus, is he describes him as the little boy lost who lurks somewhere inside Shakespeare's killing machine. And I just find that so powerful because there is something sort of naive and innocent about Coriolanus. There's some part of him that feels that if he goes to his enemies, he can resolve something, he can do something. A war can just solve his problems. If he just fights another battle, everything will be okay. And there's just something I sort of oddly agree with in that, that I, I find a little bit of that in my own life, in my own way of thinking, and that seeing how that in the end destroys Coriolanus is ultimately very, very tragic. And I think what makes this play so tragic is that despite that, the fact that this character is so different from people I know, from myself, from most things that occur in my life, there's something very, very um, similar in him and myself, and a little bit of Coriolanus in my own daily life. I can tell you that when I am working retail and I am having a bad day, that there are some thoughts there that are not so far from the things that come out of Coriolanus's mouth. 
And it's just, it's sort of jarring just to see that occur on stage and what happens in his situation. Now, I could truly, truly talk about this play for hours. I could go through every character and tell you my thoughts on them, but we would be here for days, and I do not want to do that. Um, so I'm going to leave that there. If you do get a chance to see this play performed anywhere, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. If you're fortunate enough to be somewhere where the National Theater is broadcasting Don Mars production, I, I cannot recommend that production enough. It's amazing. I'm actually going Saturday myself to see the re-airing of it at a local theater because I want to see it again. It is so brilliant, amazingly done. Um, so if you get the chance to see this play, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, but that's it for this week. Um, next week, I don't really have a topic planned yet. I'm hoping to talk about a comedy for once, talk about something a little bit happier. If not, it'll probably be one of the um, his history plays, likely Henry V or Henry IV, Part One or Two. So that's it for this week. So have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>